So let's start by dragging one of the walk frames to the scene, which will be our default idle pose. So I'll just drag gatherer walk right frame zero onto the scene. Uh, let's position it somewhere around there. And that'll create a game object in our scene automatically. I'll just rename it to be gatherer or player, whatever you prefer. And let's take these gizmos and make them way smaller because they are bigger than the actual character. So in the top right of the scene viewer, you can click here and you can take the 3D icons and you can just shrink them way down. And that should be a lot less annoying. So let's also take the gatherer transform position and just make it zero, zero. So this game object inside of our scene will be the basis of uh, our character prefab. And we're going to definitely want to save that to our project as something we can add to any scene. So in the assets folder of the project, let's create a new folder. I'll right click create folder. I'm going to call it characters. So uh, this could include player characters, NPCs, enemies, that kind of thing. Uh, let's create that folder, jump into it. And I'm going to drag the gatherer game object from our uh, actual scene into the characters folder. Just left click, drag and drop. And there we have a prefab. So if we want to edit the prefab, you can either click on the game object in our scene, which is linked to the prefab and click this little arrow. Or if you don't want to edit it in the scene context, you can just double click the prefab inside of our project. So I actually think it's going to be a lot easier to edit prefabs like this since it gives a nice blue background, which makes it very easy to see everything going on here, like collider shapes and stuff. But when you're editing the prefab in the scene, uh, like so, you get like this um, very white grayish background, which actually makes it a lot harder to see stuff like a circle collider. So just a personal preference there. Okay, so next up, let's add in the input system so that we can actually get some up, down, left, right movement for our player going on. So there is the default built in old Unity input system. And then there is the newer package, which is by Unity, uh, which is just a more flexible uh, replacement for the default input system. So we're going to use that since that's more of the modern approach. Let's go to window package manager and I am going to search Unity registry. So in the top left where you see packages in project, go to Unity registry. And then I'm just going to type in input system in the search bar <clears throat> and we'll see uh, input system 1.5. You can see very, very recently updated. And let's go ahead and install this. So when you do that, you'll get a little pop up that basically says that the new input system replaces the old stuff. And this could possibly and if you already are using the old input system for everything, then if you add the new input system to replace it, then it might make everything break. But we haven't actually used any input system yet, so this isn't going to be a problem for us. Let's just go ahead and hit yes, restart the editor. Okay, so back in the Unity project, uh, if you still have the package manager window open, you can kind of scroll down and see if input system is added to the project. So we'll see a little check mark next to input system 1.5. And uh, instead of having an install button, it has a remove button. So we know it's in the project. And let's go ahead and close that. So now I want to add the input system to our character. Let's do it in the prefab so that it will update automatically across any instance of our gatherer object in our project. So I'll just double click into the prefab, add a component, and let's type in input. Uh, let's see what's it called. Player input, I believe. Okay. And you'll see a little pop up saying that we need to have a input action asset. So let's create the input action asset. I'll hit create actions. And uh, I guess for now, we can just put it in the main folder of our project. So we could call it gatherer top down RPG input actions. If you want, I, I mean, I guess why not just save it. And then we'll get the pop up, which will show us the default action maps. So so when we take a look at the action map, you'll see that there's a few default actions set up for player and there are also actions for movement. So when the UI is absorbing stuff like uh, clicking on a button, that is these kind of things over here. And for the player, if you are doing like WASD to move, we can uh, expand the move action and you'll see the different input options you have for making this action actually happen. So you have if you're using a gamepad, you can use the left stick of the controller. If you're using a keyboard, then you have WASD on the movement in order to move your character. So basically, 
uh, one action can have multiple input options for controlling that action. And then the action itself is going to be looking for some kind of value that you can use in the code. So for move, that would be vector to the x, y input. And then in your code, you can have it do whatever you need to, such as move the player. Um, so then down here for the fire action, you can have left mouse button pressing that. And you can see that different control schemes can use or exclude different uh, input options. So if you have keyboard and mouse, then maybe it only uses the keyboard and mouse option and the game pad and everything else would be disabled. So the one thing I want to change here is renaming the fire action to be the use action. Uh, the reason for that is that we're not really firing anything. And I think that just doesn't make sense as an action name in our case. But rather, we want to use whatever tool we have in the hand, which could be a pickaxe. It could be um, a hammer. It could even be a sword. So we want to keep it kind of generic, but making sense. So I'm going to rename the fire action to be the use action. Or you could call it use tool if you want to be more specific. And for right now, we can go ahead and hit save asset. Close that out. So the import action asset is already added in here. The default scheme set to any, which means all of the controls are going to work automatically. Uh, you can just leave that set to any. If you really want to force keyboard, though, you could change it to the keyboard and mouse uh, input scheme. Now, down here at the bottom, you'll see behavior send messages. So this would mean that in code, if you want to respond to a action happening, then you need to create a function with the uh, corresponding names down here. So for the use action, which we just renamed, it would be on use. Or if you want to have it do something when the character moves, then it can be on move. So we'll just be using this default option of send messages for um, this series, just keeping it nice and simple. But, but you can also check on the behavior dropdown that you can do other options like unity events if you want to manual if you want to manually assign uh, the delegate functions in this inspector kind of view. Or you can do broadcast messages if you also want any script that is um, a child of the main game object to have something happen when these actions occur. But with send messages, it'll only be the scripts that are attached directly onto this main game object, not child game objects. So for now, we'll just use send messages, which means that in our scripts, we're going to need to create a on move function and a on use function. So we need to create something of a player controller script now. So let's add a component and I'll call it player controller new script create an ad okay so in our player controller script for right now we're not going to need update and start methods so let's just get rid of that and we are going to do a uh, void on move and don't make it on animator move it needs to be called on move and then as a parameter we need to get the action context so i believe that is import action dot callback context context and so this context parameter is how we'll get the actual input the vector to x y movement for the uh, player to move around and then we also should just add in here private void on use so in this case we can still get the callback context i believe but we're not going to need it because when the on use action happens we already know what we need to do which is to swing the pickaxe there's no further information that we actually need to pull out of it but for right now we can just leave it there and we might get like a notice about how it's never used or whatever but that's okay so for the callback context on move we want to do context.read value and the value we're trying to get is the vector2 input. So vector2. And then that's how we're going to get the axis input. So now that we're getting the vector input, I want to assign that to a private field so that we can use that across our player controller script. So I'm going to give it a new field. And I think I'll call it axis input is equal to the vector2. So let's generate a private field. Control period in uh, Visual Studio 2022 to do that. And then we can just hit generate field access input, which writes the line up here, private vector two access input. So now that it's here, anywhere we need to know what direction is currently being pressed, we have that. And so how you know that you're trying to read a value of vector two type, if we go back out to the input action asset and we look at the move action, you can see that the 
type here, value vector2 is kind of how you would look at that. So this is kind of how you can get an indication for what you're trying to look for in the actual action value. Now to actually take the import direction and move our player, we're going to need a couple of things. Uh, the first is going to be a rigid body. So I'm going to add a component rigid body 2D, since this is a 2D game, of course. We'll leave it in dynamic mode. I'm going to take gravity scale and set that to zero. Since we're doing top down, the character isn't going to be falling to the ground like it would in a platforming game, so you don't want any gravity. Uh, for constraints, we want to take freeze rotation and turn Z off. Uh, that way, if something bumps into the character or there's a force acting on our character, it won't make this sprite rotate around uh, over and over and over again like it was a ball rolling down a hill. So it'll always be facing straight up like this, moving left, right. And just remember, I'm adding this to the prefab, not the instance of the object in our game scene, so that it will synchronize all of these components uh, between anywhere we need it in the game. Okay, so that we can see the feet a little better, I'm going to click on the gizmos visibility, and let's shrink the 3D icon further. And uh, we don't need it yet, but uh, let's just add in a collider for our player in advance. So I'm going to add a component, and we'll do uh, collider 2D of some kind. I think for our character, a capsule collider should do just fine. So we'll do a capsule collider. Now, uh, we don't want the collider shape to be the size of the full character, because uh, remember when I was talking about the pivot, there's only part of the character that's actually going to be touching the ground and touching other objects. So we don't want the head to block an object from uh, being able to go a little bit closer to the player, because the head isn't a physics object in that kind of top-down sense. So what we're going to do with the capsule collider is shrink it way down and move it towards the feet. So I'm going to hit edit collider and then let's bring in the sides kind of like so. And I'm going to bring this top bit way further down to mostly the main body area of uh, the character. And you might need to change the direction to horizontal or vice versa at some point so that the different sides can be stretched kind of like so. Because uh, the difference between a vertical and a horizontal capsule collider is that it determines which um, which side, whether that's the left, right, or up, down, can be larger than the other one. So if you're wondering why you can't make your capsule collider shape horizontal like this, it's because you need to change the direction. So let's just kind of move it eh, sort of like that. And we don't really need to have a big collider. And this is always something we can just go back in and edit later. Just kind of make it like what you would think that the character in general, part of it would be touching the ground or touching other objects with its feet. And that should give you an idea of where the collider shape should be. And I'll actually make it even smaller here. Let's just do basically just the legs. And uh, we'll see how that goes. We may come back and edit this later. But yeah, once again, once again, technically the collider, we only need that for collision not necessarily to move the character. So you can move a object that has a rigid body without a capsule collider, pretty sure. So now let's go back to our player controller script. And I want to set up uh, some kind of move speed that we can apply to our character based on the directional input, and then multiplied by time dot delta time to make sure that it moves a consistent amount between frames, even if the frames take longer or shorter duration to render, basically just for consistency. So up here at the top, we want to have a field that is going to be exposed to the inspector right here for player controller. So we can set up the move speed value and assign whatever we want for it um, at any given time uh, when we're editing without having to jump into the script. So the way you would do that is you can have a private field and then serialize it. But we can take that a step further and use a property with a automatic backing field. Let me type it out and then I'll explain a little bit what's going on here. So field serialize field in the square brackets. And then we're going to have public float move speed get private set. So this bit right here makes it a property. One of the advantages of a property is that we can make it so that we can only set the move speed straight from within this script, but make it so that we can get the value of the move speed from other scripts. And we don't have to have a private set. We could make it publicly um, settable from any other script by just removing the private bit. But with the property, we have the option to set that. With a field, you either can set it or can't set it. 
if you were doing a field, something like a private read only, uh, let's say move speed here, um, then technically this would prevent it from being changed. But the thing is a read only field can't be exposed to the inspector so that you can edit it in the Unity editor. So I think this is more appropriate for what we're trying to do. Now, uh, properties aren't exposed to the inspector. So that's why we need the automatic backing field. So if you put in square brackets field here, it's going to generate an automatic backing field and serialized field is going to expose that to the inspector. So in one line, we have a property that is linked to a automatic field. And that field is what we edit in the inspector. But when we are trying to access or change the values in code, then we're going through this property. And uh, at the end here, we can also assign a default value to it. So I'm not totally sure what we're going to need for the value. So I will just default that to something like 5F. And uh, we can come back in and edit the default value later if we want. So let's go back to the inspector. We can see the move speed here. I guess the field already got hit with the default value of zero there. So I would need to manually change it here. If we added another script player controller, though, it should have the value of five defaulted as proper. So uh, let's change the move speed value to five here. Now we have a move speed value. We have the access input, but we're not doing anything with it yet. So what we need to do with those values is on fixed update, we assign a force and add that to the rigid body of the character so that the character can move in a certain direction. Because it's a physics based function, we're using fixed update, not update. So we're going to do fixed update here, and I'll just have it automatically fill out the private void part. And uh, for this access import vector two, let's just indicate that by default, this is zero, uh, vector two is zero, which means zero X, zero Y until we actually get some input from the player. Okay, so in fixed update, uh, we need to basically figure out how much force and what the direction of that force is going to be for moving the player. So uh, in order to do that, we also need to have access to the rigid body component that's attached to the game object. So let's get the rigid body first. So private rigid body 2D, I'll call it underscore rigid body as a private field. And then let's do private start. Okay. And on start, we'll do RB equals get component rigid body. Okay. So this just goes ahead and locates the rigid body component that is on the game object so that we can use it in the script. And now that it's referenced in the script, we can add forces to the rigid body. So let's do this in two lines, though we could do it in one, of course. So we'll have a vector two, and this will be, I guess, the move force. And this is going to be equal to access import for the direction times move speed. And this is going to be times time dot. We'll use fixed delta time since this should always update consistently. So we'll use that consistent value in order to calculate our move force. So uh, fixed out to time, you can actually change how many times per second that this will update inside of the uh, preferences for your game or project settings. But this should always be a consistent number. So now that we have the move force vector set up, we just need to do underscore rigid body dot add force move force. And then this should move our character that is set up with a dynamic mode rigid body. Uh, so let's go back out here and we can hit play and let's see if we can move it around the screen by doing up, down, left, right. Okay. So we get a missing method exception player controller dot on move, not found. So the reason that we're getting these, um, on use, not found on move, not found functions is because we're using, uh, send messages behavior. So nothing wrong with doing that. But when I add the callback context. That's for using invoke unity events. So if I change this to invoke unity events, you'll see that these unity events uh, require a function that takes a callback context, kind of like we have set up here. Uh, but we weren't going to do things that way. So rather than assign the function that takes a callback context, we're going to go back to send messages and we just want the input value. So let's see, it's going to look pretty similar. So input value value and then we can do value dot get we're getting a vector two so let's get rid of the read value there and uh, yeah that's basically all we need to change so uh, rather than getting the full context we're just getting the value from uh, the message being sent we can do the same thing down here as well 
though we don't need any value for on use. So if we go ahead and hit play now, we should see the messages disappear. And if I use WASD to move around on the screen, you should be able to see the character moving a little bit. Now, if we zoom in, it's going to look pretty bad. And obviously the camera is way too far from the character, so that's not going to work. But at least the input is working and the messages have disappeared. So just remember, um, if you're using Unity events, then you use the input action dot callback context like I had set up before. But if you're just using send messages, uh, then you just need to get the import value as the parameter and you can just get the value dot get vector two for the same effect. OK, so let's wrap things up for this video by setting up the camera uh, to have pixel perfect. So to do that, let's hit add component for the main camera in the scene and do pixel perfect camera. So when we have the pixel perfect camera set up here, you can go back to game view and uh, it should look a lot more correct, a lot more zoomed in on the character. We can see the reference resolution. If you want it to be uh, bigger for the character being on the screen, then you can lower the reference resolution to something like uh, 240 by 140, something like that. And you should see the character kind of scale. Yeah, so if I make it 480, it's really tiny. So we'll do something like uh, 320 by 180 by default. For grid snapping, I'm going to turn pixel snapping on um, so that all the pixels do snap to the grid when it's rendering on the camera. For the resolution, you can see this little error message that kind of pops up here saying that the pixel camera, pixel perfect camera does not work well with a free aspect ratio. So I'm going to change this to another default setting. And what I've been liking to use in the Unity editor is just 720p resolution. So you can add a new option and then do 1280 by 720p as a fixed resolution. So I'm just going to select that. And then uh, this can be the resolution, which I use for testing my game in the editor. So now we can hit play and we can uh, move around the screen very, very slowly. But it's there. And so if we want to kind of correct that a bit, let's click on the gatherer and let's change the move speed. I'll set it to 12. Let's hit play again and uh, let's test that out. Actually, uh, we can, if we want, we can even uh, change the move speed value in the editor while it's playing. So I'll just take this value and set it to 20. And now we'll move around and you should see our character moves faster. So it's a pretty handy way to just kind of play around with different settings and see what you like. So when I turn it back to five, you can see it's much more sluggish for the character. So if we make the number 50 here, then you'll see that I can just make the character indefinitely walk and there's very little or even no drag for the character. So he's not really going to stop. It's almost like the character is just standing on ice for right now, which isn't really what we want. So uh, that's something you need to play around with the linear drag. When you increase this, it's going to add a stopping force for the character moving. And if you increase the move speed, then obviously the character is going to be moving with more force. And let's rename that variable to be move force as well, to be more specific. So the values that I was finding work pretty well in uh, the demo that we're kind of rebuilding here is 100 for the move force and 25 for the linear drag. So let's hit play and kind of test that out and see how that will work for our character moving around the screen. So what I would do here is hit play and change both the move speed and the linear drag until you get values that you actually like. So if we put something like four for the linear drag and uh, I don't know, 100 for the move speed, we can move our character around the screen, see how fast it stops and see if that would make sense for our character. The character shouldn't have much sliding, so we do want a pretty strong linear drag. So I'm going to boost that up to six for now. And we probably want the character to walk a little faster on the screen. So I'm also going to boost the move speed. Let's do 150 and let's see if that's a little better. So walking fast enough now, but maybe not enough drag. So I'll try 10 for the linear drag. Stops very fast now, but not fast enough moving. So let's do 200 for the move speed. And these are values that are, at this point, kind of arbitrary. It's not really a physics-based game. So we just need the stopping and the moving to look kind of right. So we can just bump the move speed up more. 250. That's looking pretty good there. So we can go with the values of 250 and 10 for the linear drag and the move speed. So I'm going to put 250 here and click right here and do modified component apply to prefab gatherer. And then 10 for the linear drag, apply to prefab gatherer. While we're ahead, I also want to rename move speed to be um, move 
force, since we're doing a force-based character. So let's rename that up here to be move force. And I'm going to set the default value to 250, since that's what we kind of decided on. And make sure we use the right property name down here for fixed update. Now, if we go back to the Unity Editor, we'll see move force here. And we have our linear drag. Just making sure that the character prefab still has the same values. You can click into that. But you can also just tell if it's using a custom value or the prefab value. If it's a custom value, then the field here will be uh, kind of like bolded and white like that. But if you revert it to the prefab value, then it will just be grayed and not bolded. OK, so at this point, we are getting the import directional movement for our character from the new Unity import system. And we're using that to move our character around the screen using a dynamic mode rigid body and applying a force to it, having our character be slowed down by linear drag. And the next few parts will work on actually adding the animations in and having the character face the right direction depending on what the input direction is.